Well, hello, folks. This is Rebecca Tweed. Thanks for joining us this evening. It's great to have people back. And we are very excited for our first virtual town hall of 2022. Uh, we have a couple hundred people registered for tonight. So that's really exciting. We will give it a few minutes for everybody to join and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, while we're waiting for folks to get on, a couple housekeeping items. We are joined this evening by Senator Finley, Senator Tim Knope, Representative Mark Owens, and Representative and new House Republican Minority Leader, Rep. Vicki Brees Iverson. They'll be our speakers for the evening. Um, you will all be on mute for the purposes of the meeting. Um, if you have questions during the event, if you look at the bottom of your screen, please use the Q&A feature or the raise hand feature. The raise hand feature allows us to call on you and you can actually ask your question live. So we love those. You won't be on screen, but you'll be able to be vocally participating. Q&A feature comes to us and we will try to get to those as we can. As I mentioned, we've had a couple hundred people register. We've had 79 questions submitted and we know all of you will engage with us. So we will get to all the questions that we can. Please use the chat feature for questions um, about the event itself. If you're having a hard time hearing people or you can't remember how to ask a question um, or just general feedback and comments, but we'll be taking questions for the event using the raise hand in the Q&A feature. Uh, so let's give it about 30 seconds um, and then we will go ahead and, and get started with Senator Finley first. All right, Senator Finley, it is all you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and, and thank you for your staff um, in, in, uh, in establishing and setting up another very successful virtual town hall. I mean, I think what, you know, between 250, 300 people show up, you know, 75 or 80 questions. Uh, this is the best way to go about it, short of holding 10 different in-person town hall. So I appreciate it. This is, I'm going to call this a virtual town hall 2.0. As we started out with these things last year, we had about 14 of them throughout the year uh, with, with covering Senate District 30. Uh, this one is the new and improved or new and different Senate District 30 as a result of Senate Bill 882, which is a redistricting bill. Uh, Senator Canope, uh, who is the Senate Minority Leader is is taking over some of the ground that used to be in Senate District 30. So he asked if he could join to probably start that interaction with some of those folks. Representative Vicki Reese Iverson, who is a House major, Minority, soon to be Majority Leader, uh, is is the other second half of Senate District 30 after redistricting. So she represents uh, Northern Deschutes. Southern Jefferson and Crook County, as long as, as well as I do it after the, the redistricting. So we're going to uh, uh, we're going to go through this evening taking questions, and I I, I just want to say uh, I, I have a, a a few points to go over, but I, my colleagues will probably cover them all. If we don't get your quest get to your questions, which we're not going to get to all of them. We will make every effort to, to follow up with you in writing. A uh, couple of things are coming out for uh, today is the first day you can file your federal income tax. I think the state income tax season starts in a day or two. Uh, one thing that you're going to notice this year is the kicker was you get when you file your income taxes, there's a $1.9 billion kicker that's going to be credited to your income tax. If you paid tax last year, you're going to get a part of that, a portion of that back. Uh, in the form of a tax credit. Well, I'll talk a little about a legislative update. We start our short session 
35 day session begins on uh, Tuesday, February 1st and goes through Tuesday, March 8th. Uh, as we start ginning up, uh, the, the building will be open to the public. Uh, the House and Senate offices will be open to the public. Uh, the, ver the committees will all be virtual. Uh, because the building is still under construction in a lot of ways, all of the hearing rooms are, are, are under construction. The main doors going in the Capitol are still under construction in an active construction zone. The basement of the Capitol is an active construction zone. So they've, they've made a lot of changes to the Capitol. Some of them take effect later this week, which will be new, such as, you know, all participants going into the Capitol will be uh, screened, go through a metal detector and, and, and baggage shirts, including legislators. Uh, there's a lot of us that are doing the dance of joy over that little maneuver, but that's part of 2022. So as you come, and I encourage you all to come visit your Capitol at some time, expect a little different than we've had in the past. There have been some significant leadership changes uh, on the House side. Uh, on the Senate side, uh, Senate President Courtney has announced he will not seek re-election this year. So there's the jockeying has begun uh, for that. Uh, this uh, up, upcoming events that are pretty mo monumental is on February 9th is a revenue forecast. As we go through this, this budget cycle, when we had a revenue forecast in December, they projected about a $1.6 billion surplus at the end of the year at our current revenue rates. They believe, we'll know more after the ninth on where that is, but I think it's all, some indications are that it's going to exceed those levels. So we are once again, uh, bringing in record amounts of money from you, the taxpayers. Uh, and we need to figure out how we did not do that quite so much. We had a special session in December. We come over, we covered drought relief. We covered the, we started throwing a little bit of money back in the Southern uh, Oregon dealing with marijuana, illegal marijuana groves. It's a tremendous problem back in, in, in Southern Oregon uh, and when we enacted ballot measure 110, we took $40 million away from them, but we give them back $20 million, which they're still woefully underfunded. I hope that's something we can deal with in this upcoming short session. Other legislative updates, there's some pretty damning measures that are floating around. Uh, one of them being, uh, if you're a farmer or work in agriculture industry, the Ag Overtime Bill is coming back this year. Uh, currently, agriculture workers are exempt from the overtime bill. That, that, that exemption is being challenged pretty hard once again. Uh, there seems to be a tremendous amount of judicial reform occurring in every manner. And I, we had some conversations with the District Attorneys Association that some of them aren't the best bills in the world. So they're still sorting out. Hopefully, the short session is designed to... to tweak the budget, correct the budget and any deficiencies and not be major policy issues. Well, I believe there are several major policy issues and my colleagues will speak to all those as we go along. So having said that, I think I've probably rambled long enough, uh, Rebecca, but, but I just wanna say thank you to everyone and uh, we'll get to your questions soon. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Tim Canope. Share some thoughts with us, please, and welcome. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, uh, Senator Finley and Representative Owens and Leader Breeze Iverson. We appreciate uh, all of you. Uh, at least I uh, feel like you guys are um, incredible partners in the legislature. You know, it's really important for me that um, a rural Oregon gets represented well in the legislature. I have a uh, urban, suburban, and rural districts. So I pretty much have it all. I uh, represent uh, the city of Bend, half of the city of Redmond, uh, Eagle Crest, Sisters, and Black Butte, and uh, the Tumalo area, and kind of all parts uh, in between below Highway 126. So if you're south of Highway 126 in uh, Deschutes County and you're, um, you're uh, west of the 
the highway um, 97, then you are likely in my district. And uh, so I'm picking up a bunch of new people and um, I'm losing kind of the southern part of the district in Deschutes County. Uh, this session coming up is gonna be pretty critical. Uh, as the leader of the Senate Republicans, I think it's important that we focus the legislature on what they sold you uh, these short sessions would be, and that is budget, technical issues, and emergencies. And so we'll wanna see um, what bills and items fit into that um, category, into those categories. Uh, there is a bill that we are putting forward, which we believe is an emergency, uh, to help uh, treat and thin our forests, uh, because we know, uh, especially on the east side, uh, central, southern, eastern Oregon, that that is uh, critical to um, making sure that we are. Uh, Taking care of our uh, our areas, our uh, you know our trees and uh, our air quality, and that has been a struggle for the last few cycles. And we know that if we um, treat our forests and uh, prepare for uh, the fires that will come, whether they're arson or whether they're uh, nat uh, natural through lightning and so on, that um, they're going to happen. And we just need to make sure that uh, the resources are there and that we've prepared for that and that um, the state government is focused on uh, keeping people um, safe. So that's one of our bills. Another bill, uh, we believe that we need to focus on public safety and actually funding uh, law enforcement and the police. Uh, and so um, it's critical that we uh, get control of the illegal uh, marijuana grow operations that are happening in many counties. Uh, Southern Oregon has been identified with uh, Josephine and Jackson counties, but there's been some in Deschutes and Polk and Clackamas and uh, Lake, and I, I'm sure other areas as well. And uh, they are illegal grows, uh, mainly uh, from cartels from other countries. And we need to make sure that uh, those uh, don't exist and law enforcement has the resources. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, our soft on crime colleagues uh, don't uh, let uh, people who have committed murder and rape and um, assault and various crimes um, out of prison through commutation or through trying to reduce their sentences uh, because uh, you all as voters voted for Measure 11. And the reason you did is because judges were um, soft on crime and not giving uh, adequate sentences. So we wanna make sure that uh, we're paying attention to um, the public safety things that you care about, that you're safe, uh, feel safe in your home and your neighborhood. And uh, I feel like those are urgent and uh, emergency uh, type bills. And well, there's a, there are a few more bills, but uh, I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for our house colleagues to uh, talk with you this evening too, but it's uh, really my honor to, uh, to be with you and uh, I look forward to uh, more discussions in the future. Thanks, Senator. Representative Owens. Thanks, Rebecca. We're gonna, we're gonna make leader Vicki Breeze Iverson go last. That's not really fair. She won't have anything to say, but uh, thank you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. We haven't done these for a couple of months. We wanted to respect uh, the ability for people to enjoy their family for the holidays. So I hope you did that. I hope you had a good time with your family. I hope you're enjoying winter. We had some good precipitation that came and looking forward to some more. But I, I know uh, we were talking before this and we're excited to get back into this avenue. We've done some uh, in-person virtual town hall or in-person town halls that were good, but there's no other form that we can connect with this many people at one time. So thank you for taking the time to join us. As the, the senators both said, uh, short session is coming. We've been focusing mainly on that. Uh, each representative, each center is limited to two bills. And as uh, leader Knope said, uh, they should be, you know, in three items, emergency, budgetary or small policy tweaks. I'm only bringing one bill forward and I believe it 
definitely fits in the emergency. In fact, it's about the governor's emergency powers. It's uh, LC 49, it's going to become House Joint Resolution 206. As we've talked about previously in some of these meetings, some of us feel that there's been an imbalance of power between the three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial. And as your legislators on this call, the way that we can try to make a difference there is by bringing legislation forward. And that's what we're trying to do. In fact, I'll just briefly run down what that bill would do. That bill, if successful, will actually take it to the ballot for all of the voters in the state of Oregon to see if it's a good idea. And what it does is it limits the uh, governor to declare an emergency declaration for 30 days. During that declaration, they must state the reasons why and the counties that are affected. After a 30 day period of time, those local county electeds, board of commissioners, county courts can make a justification of that emergency declaration still should go on in their counties. If they don't believe it is an emergency in their county anymore, they can rescind that. If they rescind that, the state of Oregon cannot come back on repercussions against them monetarily or anyplace else. And the governor cannot declare that same emergency for a year within that county. It also could allow the legislative body to come back after 30 days and rescind the whole emergency power across the state of Oregon. It does not affect the article in the constitution that really has the governor ability to declare catastrophic emergency because we understand that could be needed at some time but it does give a checks and balance. So for successful in passing it through the legislature, you'll be able to vote on that in the state of Oregon in November. And the reason we're going that route is some of you know, we tried this in the long session. We're unable to convince our colleagues even to get a public hearing. So I think it's an easier conversation for us to make with our colleagues is that you're actually going to oppose allowing your community or constituents to vote on this. So that's why we're taking that path. So hopefully we'll get some traction. Hopefully we'll get a committee hearing and hopefully you'll see it on the ballot in November and you can support it if you like. A couple other ones I, I learned last time is, as some of you know, I'm closing in on two years and being a legislature. So my first session was a short session two years ago and it happens hard and fast. I mean, 35 days, the first deadlines in a week. If you're not ready, for the bills that are coming, if you don't already have amendments crafted, you're never going to get anything done. So there's three bills that have come up in the last two weeks that myself and my office are working on amendments currently so that we can try to craft them to where our communities in East Oregon can support them. One of them is a requirement for school boards to get education and training. You know, that sounds like a good concept, and I support that. But this bill has manifested itself into 15 pages and is arduous, makes more requirements on superintendents, and it is not meeting the need of allowing our school districts to decide what type of training our school board should have. So we're going to craft some major amendments on that one. Another one I'd hit on real quickly is the renewable diesel conversation is coming forward again. And, you know, renewable diesel by itself is a good thing. We should allow the private market to look at renewable diesel. And if it's an alternative fuel, hey, we'll support that. If it can make economic growth opportunities in Eastern Oregon by taking Juniper, making it renewable diesel, great. But what this bill is doing is it's going to try to ban petroleum diesel again. Hey, we're not ready for that. State of Oregon's not ready for that. Farmers and ranchers aren't ready for that. And the last one that we're working on is the cannabis water enforcement. As uh, Senator Knope said, there's some horrific things happening down in Southwest Oregon that we need to try to get a handle on. These illegal grows that are happening should not. But we gotta make sure when we start talking about water policy and water law, that we don't have unintended consequences that aren't really going to affect a difference down in Southwest Oregon. So we're continuing to work on that. And with those three great bills that we're working on in minutes, I'll hand it over to Rebecca. We'll probably hand it over to Vicki. I will. Well, thank you. And uh, before I do that, we've had a number of new people join. So I just want to welcome you to our town hall with Senator Finley, Senator Knope, Rep Owens, and we're about to hear from House Leader Rep Vicki Brees Iverson. So thanks to the new folks who've joined. Uh, after we hear from the representative, we'll turn to some questions and answers for all of you. 
Thank you. I want to first and foremost thank everybody on this this town hall and for being included tonight. This was a, a huge honor and pleasure to to have my first virtual hearing with the good Senator Lynn Finley and and Representative Mark Owens. I know they've been doing this for a while, and I appreciate that uh, Senate Major or to be Majority Leader Tim Canope was able to join us tonight as well. So thank you guys for being part of this. I am Vicki Bruce Iverson. I am from Crick County. I'll give just a quick update of who I am because I do want you all to know where I come from and where my roots are. I am a fifth generation cattle rancher in Crick County. My family came into to Oregon in, in the 1850s and we've been solid in Primeville ever since. I am proud to be raising my two boys on the same ranch that I grew up on. I have a, my husband and I have a, a 14 year old and an almost 16 year old. So I have not just the legislative session to be concerned about, but a almost new driver to be concerned about. So my hair may be turning gray in this next legislative session. Beyond that, I currently represent House District 55, which is all of Crick County. And then it goes south, includes Lakeview or to Lakeview over to Klamath Falls and into Jackson County. So a lot of the issues that, that you guys are concerned about, I've been involved with for the last few years. And I've worked with Senator Finley and Representative Owens on a lot of the issues out of Lake County and in, into, into Crick County. They're, they're all very similar. Um, growing and being born and raised in Central Oregon and part of the cattle community for generations, I can tell you that Eastern Oregon and, and Central Oregon really comes from the same cloth. And I am proud to represent and proud to be continuing to represent Central Oregon as we move forward in this in these new districts. Having said that, we'll run into the district to what we're looking at in this short session. Um, I won't con won't repeat what everybody else has said, which is the intention of a short session. We are way far away from what the initial intent of a short session is. And therefore I will, along with the, my colleagues on this call and my colleagues in the house, and I'm sure in the Senate, push back against the big issues that are gonna come in front of us. It really is supposed to be just the fixes that, that we didn't quite get right in the last legislative session that we should be looking at. And we're all aware that that's not the case of what we're about to walk into. In that short 35 days that Representative Owens mentioned, I just got noticed that we have about 150 bills in the House that have been introduced. That is that is way too many bills to, to actually articulate and put thoughtful conversation into and make sure that we get right coming out of short session. So I'm hopeful that we'll have real conversations as we move in and through short session, but um, we haven't really had a, a lot of trust from our, our speaker in the house in, in previous sessions. We do have new leadership walking into this new session. So we'll watch for their actions to prove up that they want to have different conversations and we're going to hold them to their to those words so that we can protect Oregonians rights. We've had enough of the failed Democrat leadership in Oregon and Oregonians absolutely deserve better. So I enjoy the, the opportunity to work with this group of folks and, and make that a, a real case as we go through short session and, and hopefully come out through the elections of 2022 with a little different balance in Salem. Very quickly, I, ha I do have two bills that I am introducing and they are both at the bequest of, of associations that have reached out to me. One is for the Oregon State Troopers Association, and that is a bill that they are asking for the creation of an advisory committee where they would have input for the superintendent that oversees them. And I, I very hard, wholeheartedly believe that it's, it is a good thing if we have an association that we have representation from within the, the members of that association that are, that are overseeing the, the uh, the group of, of troopers out in Oregon. So I do that with, with pleasure. The other one, and, and I maybe didn't mention this, but I am also a real estate agent, have been for 20 years. There is always something that has to pay for the hobby of ranching and farming. I think that we can all agree to that. So uh, real estate is something that I got into 20 years ago and, and it, it absolutely helps take care of my cows. But the, the Real Estate Association has come to me and asked if I would put together a bill that, that would actually protect a lot of the Eastern Oregon border. There's a, 
there's a, a few realtors maybe from the Idaho area and maybe other surrounding states that come into Oregon and they do business. They're not licensed in Oregon. It's not that they don't know what they're doing, but the reality is, is that they're not taking the time to be part of our agency and get licensed in Oregon. So the penalty for that right now is about $500. And I actually, and this may be the first and only ever fee increase I ask for, which is to increase the penalty for those that choose to do business in Oregon without the proper license. And the, the bill really just reflects what it is if, if an Oregon realtor were to go into another state, uh, particularly Idaho, and do that, it would be about a $5,000 fine. I believe that's the same number for Washington. And this bill sets us in parallel with those surrounding states. So it, it hopefully will keep us a little bit more up and up on our, on our realtors and who's representing who in the state of Oregon. And that is to protect all of you guys as you're being represented in the state of Oregon. So with that, I will, I will let us move on to the next portion of our virtual town hall, Rebecca. Well, thank you so much, Representative. And we're so glad you could join us today and introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, we've had a number of questions about education. So let's get started with some of those. Senator Finley, the first question um, is for you from Dawn in Prairie City. Uh, and maybe Senator Finley and Rep Owens, you can touch on, on this, both of you. But what are your thoughts on expanding school choice options for families such as access to virtual schools? And how has that changed with the pandemic and the way that education models have changed for our families? Thank you, Rebecca. I'll start and uh, representing Owens, the our, our resident school board chair can, uh, can, can clean up. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer in choice. I believe that, you know, we've attached some artificial caps several years ago. Uh, they, they, they didn't work then and they work less now, especially with the virtual environment that we're going. So I believe that the school choice needs to be opened up and, and I'd like to see the caps removed. I don't think we'll ever get to that, but we certainly should, we should index them for inflation. We should raise them with the appropriate numbers of students and we should look at all the different the vehicles out there, the virtual charter schools, all the other virtual schools. Um, we need to we need to harvest those abilities and, and put more kids in them. So I believe that we should lift them. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Finley. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Great question. Uh, I am on the education committee, and one of my uh, things we keep trying to position ourselves for is educational choice. Right now, educational choice is limited by the zip code you live in, depending on whether your school district is at maximum capacity to allow those to go to charter schools. I'm not supportive of that. I think competition in schools is good. I think competition is good for, for everyone to bring their best for themselves. Uh, last long session, I had a couple of bills about educational choice and we were unsuccessful getting committee hearings on any of them. I reached out to the chair, Alonzo Leon at the House Education Committee and said, uh, Madam Chair, can we get a committee on educational choice, a hearing on a bill? And she told me, no, not in the short session. So I did not bring any bills for the short session, but what I have committed to a lot of our friends on educational choice is in the midterm after the session, I'll form an ad hoc committee and we'll bring some of our stakeholders in and we'll bring those that are opposed and supportive of educational choice. And we'll start trying to craft some legislative concepts for 2023. So my commitment to this group is I'll be actively engaged in that conversation after the short session and hopefully we can find some path forward. Thank you. Great, well, thank you for that. Um, this next question is for Representative Brees Iverson. Um, can you get into a little bit about what the Ag Overtime Bill is, uh, what the impacts might be, and um, who's pushing for Ag Overtime? What, what, just tell some of us about that. We had 17 questions about Ag Overtime. So as our resident cattler, maybe you can <laughs> talk about that with us. Ag overtime is to be to to kind of quantify it. Several years back, there was a, a bill that came through session that really talked about overtime in manufacturing 
business or industry. And the, the language that was put forward and adopted into statute did not exempt out agriculture as an industry. Today, what we're looking at with this ag overtime is really because that language wasn't put together with enough thoughtful forward thinking, shall we say. Maybe we rushed through some of those concepts, like we mentioned earlier tonight. We really need to take the time to, to think about the, those unintended consequences that happen. And what we're dealing with today is really a, a causation of unintended consequences from, from I believe it was two th or 2017 when that, that first legislation went through. And the, the reality of that is that there is a group of, of folks, and I don't know who all the the uh, folks are behind it. I think Pacoon is the leading driver of it, but I by no means think that they're the only ones uh, that that are really pushing for ag overtime in in ag employees. And that is that's devastating if we start talking and thinking about how agriculture is as an industry diverse around the state of Oregon. You know, you've got orchards, you've got berries, you've got uh, vines. They all have a, a different harvest time and different times of the year that that those industries are are more intensive and require more hours in a in a short period of time than than other jobs, other manufacturing jobs that might be a little bit more steady throughout the year. Um, for instance, the in the cattle world. You know, when my cows start to drop calves, I'm on. We go out at all hours and we watch. And if and if you're not doing that, then you could you could really miss a problem and, and lose calf, perhaps cow that way. I think we're all kind of aware of that when we're when we're trying to get the hay out of the field, if the rain's coming, you're out there 24-7 till the hay's up. These are things that I, I really think are not taken into account in totality as they look at the simple idea of a 40 hour work week, which is ultimately the, the driving force of, of the big ag overtime issue. They want to, they want to minimize or, or require any hours over 40 hours for an employee in, in an ag industry to, to get that time and a half pay. And there's a lot of workers that that will come into our state and there's programs designed to bring workers into our state for certain harvests for certain certain sectors of that industry. And they'll work a lot of hours in a three month period, but then they take the next four months or five months off and they they do other things they that's their lifestyle. So what we're what we're looking at what what is on the table in front of us really hasn't been fully vetted. There's several things that are that are floating. I think there's a bill coming forward that will look like a bill that, that was in front of us last session, but I've already heard that there's some amendments to it where we don't have all of our bills back out of LC. I don't know that we've seen the end of this yet. Um, conversations have been around trying to take that 40 hour work week and extend it to, to or rather have it started maybe a 58 hour work week and ratchet it down towards 40 in the in the course of x number of years these these conversations really aren't real as it pertains to the actuality of each different harvest for each sector of agriculture and what we're trying to do is make sure that we have real conversations the the crux of this whole ag overtime issue and why it is really a, a hard one to to bring into a 35 day session is that there was a lawsuit filed with regard to the concept, and then there was, I think, a, a, a judgment. I'm not sure if it was a full judgment. You guys might be able to, to back me up on that one, Mark. But the, the reality was is that the, the courts have entered into this conversation at this point, and the courts have, have told Bully that they need to render their opinion and perhaps start administrative rules making. So there's several nuances to this this ag overtime conversation that if we really do something in this 35 day session we're we're likely going to get out over our skis on it we're not going to we're not going to take care of it the way that we should be taking care of it which is thoughtful and inclusive of all sec sectors of ag and and not just for the ag industry but for the the ag employees that we're going to affect in this so that was maybe a lot of history and a little bit of of your answers and guys feel free to jump in 
considering how many questions we had on it, I think that was very, very helpful overview. And, and for folks participating, we will follow up with everybody after the town hall also to make sure you have uh, links to track things for the special session and um, updates and, and ways to be involved in this a little bit, uh, a little bit more often. Sorry, my Zoom's breaking out a little bit. Um, Representative Owens, a question for you from Paul in Legrand. So even though he's out of your district, um, the Oregon Department of Education offices in Salem are still closed to the public and our schools are largely in person and have been for a majority of the pandemic. If it's safe for students and staff and faculty to be returning, do you have any idea why the state agency offices are still closed to the public? Do we have information on if that may change given some of the hardships that causes? Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you, Commissioner, for the question. I happened to read this one prior. Um, we were hopeful that state agencies would go back in, in person and start fulfilling their services that they need to provide to the community at the first of the year. Unfortunately, that has not occurred. An OD is one of those. And you're dead right. The safest place and the best place for our students is in school, and I'm thankful that they are. But our state agencies need to get back into person. They need to start serving the communities. That is a conversation that all three of us and Senator Knope just joined us again. All four, four of us will continue to push. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. I let this one slip off my radar, but we'll get back involved. Well, perfect timing for Senator Canope to join. Um, Senator, you've been a champion for the kicker and the kicker being returned to uh, Oregonians. Can you discuss it in the sense of what, is it, what does it really mean? What should people be looking for? And are you aware of any um, proposals to take the kicker away from Oregonians uh, in this legislative session or, or any ballot measures? But Maybe just give folks a, an idea of what that term means when we throw it around. Uh, absolutely, sure. Um, and, and just so you all know, um, I do apologize uh, for coming in and out. My connectivity here, even in Bend, Oregon, uh, is not that great. Um, and so it um, seems like about every 10 or 15 minutes, I start to uh, circle the drain on this uh, internet thing. So I have to get back in, but uh, uh, the kicker, was my priority bill in the 1999 session. It was called HGR 17. And uh, we put it on the ballot for you all to put it in the constitution because pretty much every session, there was a uh, rumor and the like uh, from our Democrat colleagues who uh, wish to get rid of it because uh, they don't think uh, that money that was not anticipated uh, should go back to you, the taxpayer. I do, and I think a lot of my Republican colleagues do. And therefore, we voted to put this uh, out to the voters, and you put it in the Constitution, uh, where it sits today. Uh, the corporate kicker was amended a few years back and uh, now goes to an education fund. Uh, but the personal kicker is as it was in, when it was passed into the Constitution in 1999. Uh, well, actually, it was the 2000 election uh, from the 99 session. And so I think over uh, the history of the kicker, it's returned about $6 billion. As the good Senator said earlier, it's gonna return about 1.9 billion, which is a record, uh, which for each household, the average household will get about $850 back. I trust you uh, to use that $850 for your family's priorities. And I do not trust the government with 1.9 billion dollars. We can sit here the rest of this meeting and talk about the corruption and the um, the basically the failures of government, and uh, we only have to talk about a 300 million dollar website that didn't ever sign anybody up for health care. Uh, and uh, there's 10 other examples just like that. And so it's really important that when we have these kinds of overages that they get returned to you, the taxpayer, and you get to decide how that money is spent uh, in your own community, on your own family. And um, with the, the state has plenty of reserves, so don't let anybody uh, try to tell you different. There are billions of dollars that are in reserve, different reserve counts. 
so this, the state is not suffering uh, financially. We have more money coming into the state than we've ever had in the history of the state. So uh, the state can certainly share that tax revenue with you and they will be forced to because the kicker is in the constitution. And I thank you for doing that. <laughs> well, thank you, Senator. I think we all appreciate that. Uh, speaking of tax dollars, Senator Finley, a couple questions have come in um, and about marijuana taxes. I know you've introduced some legislation in the short session. You wanna talk about that a little bit and then maybe broadly uh, marijuana revenues and taxes in general for folks? I will. Thank you, Rebecca. I, <clears throat> I've introduced uh, legislation that will allow a community that has retail marijuana operations to put before the voters of that community a measure to see whether they would like to raise the taxes on retail sales of marijuana in their communities. Uh, basically gives the the local jurisdictions the authority to deal with their own jurisdictions by a vote of the people. Uh, it, it's originally started in Ontario. Uh, Ontario is one of the most unique places in the state when it comes to marijuana sales. Uh, Ontario sells 10% of the recreational marijuana in the state of Oregon. Last year, 2021, that amounted to about $115 million worth of sales. Uh, roughly 1% of that is sold to Oregonians. 99% of it is sold to Idahoans, who there's 850,000 people who live within 50 miles of the Oregon border over here. And they looks like whenever you drive to Ontario, most of them are there most any given day. Uh, the congestion, the public safety issues are intense. Uh, and those folks don't come in, they don't shop around locally. All they do is, is uh, is traverse and impact the public safety measures and the city of Ontario would like the ability to, to harvest some money from those folks to help pay the increased cost of, of public safety issues. And, and since then, there's been a few other communities that would like that opportunity as well. And this is, all this measure does is gives the authority for those communities to have a referendum vote of the people to raise those taxes on their sales. It would raise it up to 10% uh, so currently a city gets 3% now, it would allow them to go up to 10% uh, and uh, by a vote of the people. So it, it's a good thing. Marijuana, the illegal marijuana market is there and in, 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 in very healthy. I read someplace yesterday, they figured that the, they have, they've, they've busted about $2.5 billion worth of illegal marijuana groves. Uh, There's a large article in the Capitol Press over the weekend that uh, a, 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 a retired couple had rented out five acres of their farm for a hemp grow. A hemp grow. It was actually a marijuana grow. That couple's been fined $150,000 for not having proper permits on their property. Uh, it's devastating to those folks. So uh, we got to do more. And, and the law enforcement in those counties are way over their uh, their budget authority. They're they're undermanned, understaffed, under equipped to deal with the issues, and we got to help them. Uh, we put a bandaid on it in the special session. I certainly hope that we have the ability to to plug a big hole in that in the in the near future to help these communities out. It's a public safety issue. So, thank you. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um... We've had a number of questions, of course, about masks and schools and mask mandates. Specifically, Carrie from Burns asks if there are any plans in place to allow local school districts to begin making decisions about testing and masks for their specific districts and returning local control. Mark, you're a big advocate for not one size fits all and have worked on this. Can you answer Carrie's question and talk about mask mandates a little bit? Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks, Carrie. Um, unfortunately, like the last question I, I answered, there seems to be no path forward in order to understand how local communities, if the need is not there, can get rid of the mask mandates, the social distancing, and get our kids returned to a more normal school life. Uh, kind of disappointing. In fact, uh, 
the, the state has no uh, metrics. Uh, we've asked for them several times. Uh, what is our goal? What are we shooting for? How can we get out of this situation? And they, they won't tell us. Uh, disappointed that I don't have better news. The authority of OHA with emergency powers and our current administration is, is overwhelming and overburdening. The uh, ones that are affected the most are, are our children. I mean, I have kids in public school, my wife teaches. Um, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing when young men and women are trying to uh, listen and learn and can't read lips and can't have a normal social reaction. Uh, I'm going down a path here. I mean, I'll, I'll try to make it quick, carry out, carry. We'll keep working. Well, what's on it going to take is a new governor, a new administration to repeal back some of these. These all can be repealed, even though they're quote, quote, permanent. With the right executor, which is our governor, we can change this. And that's collectively all what we hope can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Iverson, uh, a question, Brees Iverson, excuse me, a question for you from Robin that's come in. Are there any bills in the works that will help to provide additional mental and behavioral health supports in the schools uh, as a result of the pandemic, specifically any funding that could be used to support increased services and staff? Thank you for the question. That is actually one of the things that is on my horizon. And to be to answer your your question specifically, I am I haven't seen the full list of bills. We don't have them out of LC yet because we don't have that. Uh, apparently, we just don't. LC is overburdened by the 150 concepts they received, and we haven't been able to get all of those back from from them in in bill form. We don't actually get to see the LCs unless some, the person who's who has authored them shares them with us. So to to specifically answer your question, I am not sure of an exact bill that will provide this resource, but it is something that is very much on my horizon and something that I talk to to my colleagues, my the both the 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 new almost elected speaker of the house and the the. Uh, governor about every time I talk to him we've done we've we have hurt our kids tremendously and not just our kids but but all of Oregonians by the things that we that the state has enacted in the last two years in the name of COVID and the pandemic and we really do need to pay attention to the mental health and the behavioral health that is a, a cause and effect out of out of what we've done in the last two years so again it's it is something that that i view as as a failure on our leadership our state's leadership and it is something that we are we are fighting for that we are looking for uh, as far as rolling out a new program i am unaware of any new programs that are proposed at this time but there's definitely some things in place that we need to make sure as we look at those budget fixes we've got resources available for folks in in need great thank you representative a uh, question for senator finley from eric um, who does some work in burns he is curious about um, certain properties in Burns that are both opportunity and enterprise zones. Some questions, what should buyers and sellers be looking to the state of Oregon to support the hospitality industry? Um, is there anything that the legislature is doing to that effect? And um, is Business Oregon and other organizations helping support and get things done in Senate District 30 to help grow our businesses back? So kind of a two-part question, but uh, definitely in your lane of things. Well, thank you, Eric, for the question. Business Oregon is certainly fully engaged in looking for support for all, all potential businesses. I know I, I have a fairly regular meetings with them. To, it's called the Regional Solutions Group. Uh, they, you know, they have broken down most of the different phases uh, of, of the governor's office to look at programs to figure out how we can help businesses throughout the state. Uh, and not just hospitality, but any ventures. So uh, there are plenty of programs out there. I mean, I and, and through economic development and, and the regional solutions groups, I would encourage you to, to engage with the local economic development offices in the communities. Uh, they have direct ties to the regional solutions and, and all the programs that are available. 
there are enterprise zones opportunities in most counties that, that can help some of those, but to fully engage Business Oregon via the local economic development office. I know Harney County has a pretty active economic development coordinator in an office there, uh, and uh, they can certainly help. Great, and Eric, we will follow up and make sure you get the links to the economic development offices. I realize that I have been talking a lot and have not allowed anybody who raised their hand to ask a question like I prompted. So Peggy, uh, we are going to do the raise hand feature with you. I'm gonna unmute you in a moment and give you a, a second just to ask your question. So make sure to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Peggy. Good evening, all. Um, I wanted to know, um, Rep Owen, a little bit more about the, the diesel um, diesel bill you were talking about earlier. I think that would um, be a great subject that, that our membership in Timber Unity would love to hear about more. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, right now, I do not have a bill number. It was legislative concept number 63, and it's similar to the one that came through last time. So what they would do is they would try to phase out uh, petroleum diesel in the metro area first and then move across the state of Oregon. Uh, it's a little bit more refined, but it's still detrimental. Uh, Peggy, uh, we'll put our emails in the chat there. Email my office. I've had a couple of texts. We'll share the language with you. We will are trying to craft a study amendment for that. We'll share that with you so we can collectively work together. But give me an email. We'll keep you in the conversation. All right, Senator Canope, another question for you. I, I love that you get these questions. Um, I know you addressed it in your opening. What was the original intention of the short legislative session and are we adhering to it? If we're not, uh, is there anything we can do to change it? And if we are adhering to it, then great. <laughs> you wanna tackle that? You've been around a long time through some of these, so. Uh, you bet. Uh, so all of us uh, as legislators take an oath of office to support and defend the constitution of the state of Oregon and the United States. And I think we take that uh, very seriously and we want a constitutional government. And so um, about a little over 10 years ago on the ballot, uh, you all were asked the citizens to put in the constitution a short session. And the way that was sold to you was that it would be about 35 days and it would be about emergencies, technical fixes and the budget. It has been anything but those three things. Uh, they, it, it really what it is, is it's a session to get uh, the agenda of the majority party that they didn't get in the long session. And so you saw that as it related to the carbon bill a couple of years ago, they didn't get that in the 19th session, they came back in the 20th session and you know tried to do that. And then the governor did it by executive order, what she could. Um, and so what we've seen is some very complex issues try to work their way through these 35-day sessions. And uh, as uh, Rep. Owens indicated, you really can't do anything in a week uh, as it relates to the legislature, unless, of course, you're not going to be transparent and you're not going to involve the public. In that case, you can do a whole lot of stuff. And so that's what's been happening. And we're kind of sick of it uh, because we think, we ought to adhere to the Constitution and what was originally said about these short sessions. And so um, that's why I say we want to run through the filter every bill. What's the emergency? What's the technical fix? And is this a budget item? And there are plenty of those items. There are also plenty that are not emergencies and that are just agenda items for, for legislators. And uh, I was a big advocate for cutting the number of bills uh, we did that in the Senate for a couple of sessions where senators only got one bill. The House did not follow suit. Um, you know, I quite frankly, I prefer zero bills in the short session. Uh, and that way we could focus on fixing the budget because uh, there's a whole lot of uh, 
a waste and abuse in state government that we could get to if 90 legislators focused on the budget uh, for 35 days. Well, great. Well, we have a number of questions um, still, but we are five minutes from time when we want to respect everybody's time. So I'm going to ask everybody to give a, a quick closing, but we did get one question from Mark Berg uh, early on who asked, just curious if there's any one issue that collectively all of you are concerned about in 2022. Um, maybe you can address that in your closing remarks this evening, what you're concerned about and we can decide if it's collective or not <laughs> after we get your answers. Um, so Representative Brees Iverson, why don't we start with you and uh, again, thanks everybody for being here. We will get back to you uh, and answer your questions and provide links to the things we've talked about if we didn't get to you. So uh, Representative. Thank you. You know, the, the one thing that I think we can all agree on and that I'll put out there, it's, it's not specifically an issue, but it certainly is at the forefront. And that is that short sessions not meant for big issues. So if there's one thing we can, we could all collectively agree to and work forward on, it is limiting the scope of a 35 day session. I, again, I know that's not an issue particularly, but, but in reality, it's, where it's where our lane should be and we should be staying in it for a short session. If I was to pick an issue, I would say that this egg overtime is the issue that we need to be paying attention to. It's one of many that I that, that are starting to, to move forward. Again, we shouldn't be doing any of these as the fixes in the short session. We should be looking at them as work groups and, and trying to figure out what, what the scope of the whole issue is and, and what, how it best works for, for making sure that it wins for all of Oregon and all of Oregonians. The, the reality of, of where I am and, and where I come from as a legislator that I would just like to leave with you is I am a small town ranch girl and I have watched my community show up in really big ways to support those in their community. And one of the things that I truly love about Oregon and traditional Oregon, as I will refer to it time and again, is how in traditional Oregon, we do support our own communities and we, we make good decisions for those in and around our areas. I think that as Oregon moves forward, we need to go back to local controls. We need to make sure that communities get to, to decide for themselves how best to manage, how best to work through dollars that come through, because every community in Oregon is a little bit different. Each community is, is we're just as geographically different as our state is, so are our communities. And I think that that is the heart of Oregon, that's traditional Oregon. And if there's something that we can do moving forward, it's to remember that and it's to embrace it as we, as we look forward into the future. So with that, I will say thank you very much for including me this evening, for, for letting me participate. I look forward to more of these. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Rebecca. Rep Owens. Thanks, Rebecca, and your staff for putting on another good virtual town hall. And, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I think we still have 152 people sitting here to listen to four politicians. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm sorry for you or thankful for you, but no, I am thankful. Thank you for joining us. Um, the number one issues, I think Vicki Breeze, Rep. Vicki Breeze Iverson hit on the head is uh, try to limit the scope, try to get in and out of there. The issue that you just heard about is a short time period, and we haven't even seen all the bills. We haven't even seen the language in all the bills. We don't know, honestly, what's coming forward. Some small conversations we've had. I prioritized three of mine that we're working on. We talked ag overtime, but honestly, we don't even know the scope of this session until it's three to four days from the first day of session. There's something broken there. So I think our collective wisdom here would be to try to minimize, keep it to what the voters voted on and get in and out of there. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to pass it on to uh, leader, Senator Tim Canope. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Rep Owens. I appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us. I uh, appreciate uh, you uh, tuning in and uh, hearing about what's, what's coming up. I would encourage you to engage in this session and try to do what you can to uh, 
uh, influence and uh, let us know how you feel. I think if there's one issue that we all four would agree on, I don't want to commit anybody's vote or nothing, but what I would say is Rep. Owen's bill about limiting the powers of the governor. I think we probably all agree that you should get a chance to vote to do that, uh, seeing as how uh, part of the reason she has this power is because you all were uh, told to vote on a bill uh, some years back that expanded her power. And it was thought um, about an earthquake or tsunami or some natural disaster. Uh, no one had uh, a uh, pandemic and COVID on its mind. And we all know uh, that the, the governor has um, taken uh, the power pretty much solely on herself, sidelined the legislative branch. And we need to return to our constitutional form of government, which is a three branch system. And the only way to do that is to uh, make sure that the governor has to consult with the legislative branch after a certain period of time during an emergency. So uh, I would say that that is one thing that we can all uh, work on together to get you the opportunity to vote on that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Canope. I guess I'm next. So if not, Rebecca will yell at me. Uh, well, I'd like to thank everyone for their time tonight. There's nothing more sensitive or, or precious to people and as their time. And you guys have given us a little over an hour so far of your time, and we appreciate that. You know, I, it, I've, a, I've been asked repeatedly, well, what's my, the major issue for me? What's my number one issue? I represent 41% of this state. I have 12 counties that, that are part that I represent. And there's a lot of diversity between those counties. So it's hard for me to say one of them, but, but I guess if it would be anything, it's, it's the overreach that the state has had. It's the, 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 the lack of, of unintended consequences evaluation of every bill that we do. We pass all these measures and they may sound like a really good idea if you live in downtown Portland, but they don't work very well in Condon or they don't work very well in Spray or Prineville or Jordan Valley. And we have to, then we have to try to figure out how to fix them and patch them up. And it just doesn't work. Uh, the scope that we're doing about, I mean, we're legislating in out of a fire hose. I mean, to think that we have 150 bills coming at us and we can't read them. We can't even look at them. If you go to look at the LCs, which you don't have access to in the legislative concepts, you don't have access to them anyhow, but they're more than likely going to change significantly from the first draft that floats around to, to what comes out of a bill. So we have to go into the legislative session that starts a week from tomorrow with not a heck of a lot of idea what we're going to be having a conversation about. And that's wrong. Uh, and because in, in just nine days from then, that's the first chamber deadline for bills. And, and if they're not moving, hopefully they will die. And well, hopefully out of the 150 bills, 149 of them, maybe 148 of them will die. So Representative Owens bill that I'm a chief sponsor on as well should make it and my marijuana bill should make it. But other than that, I think they all ought to die. But so, but another major issue is that is the frustration. The frustration level is growing in all of Oregon. You know, I have eight counties that I represent that have all signed a, signed a uh, pass an ordinance that says that let's study and look at about moving the border to Idaho. So, and that's, that's a matter of just pure frustration. Now that doesn't represent the, the backers of that, the people that sign that do not represent all of the people in those districts. And we know that, and we're not gonna move on any of that stuff in my mind until that's a fully fully supported within all the population in the, in the counties. But, but it's just a level of frustration. You know, the bills that are passed in Portland come out and we have to, we're, we're spoon fed them and it doesn't matter what we think they just go through. So it's very frustrating and uh, and, and the best way to do that is for everyone to become engaged. Participate in the process, sign up. Uh, you have an opportunity to provide testimony to every one of these 150 bills as they come through in this process. Uh, and it's all gonna be done virtually. So you can just go into the Oregon Legislative Information System. I think we probably mailed you those links repeatedly. Find out the bills that you like, sign up and write testimony on whether, whether it works for you or not. I think this last bit of 
of, of the public hearings that they're holding this week on, on the mask mandate. They've had hundreds of people sign up to testify. That's how to turn the tide just a little bit. So I encourage people to be fully engaged and involved in the process. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Rebecca for, and, and your staff for doing an incredible job. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. We appreciate your time. We will catch all of you in the next one and happy new year. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all.